if someone's feeling isolated right now, what is that doing to their brain? Being isolated is a form of stress. Mm -hmm. When people are, when humans are isolated, they start start to show uh, rises in cortisol and basically triggers the HPA response, stress response. Short-term stress can be a good thing um, because when we are stressed for a short period, whether it's from isolation or stress at work or a saber-toothed tiger presenting itself to battle, uh, our bodies kind of prepare for the challenge. And so we can, you know, it could be anti-inflammatory. We can have all these great benefits. It changes in the brain as well with like receptors going to the outside of neurons, like ready to take in new signals is really fascinating. But then when that stress stays for a long time, so for mm -hmm. example, if we are isolated for an extended period, that adaptive stress response becomes maladaptive, becomes unhealthy. And so in long-term stress, what we often see is chronic inflammation because cortisol is anti-inflammatory. I know that's confusing. You just say it causes inflammation, but it's anti-inflammatory. Well, with chronic stress, the body's tissues become sort of desensitized mm -hmm. to the cortisol's ability to normally turn down inflammation. So in lay terms, basically the the one of the body's anti-inflammation systems is out of order. And so what happens is this rise in inflammation that can affect all the, these tissues in the body, including the brain. And so the stress response itself over the long term probably has a you know direct relationship with the mood deficits we see. So isolated people are uh, at higher risk of anxiety and depression, also suicidality. Mm -hmm. But as far as the health detriment, right, people are at higher risk of dementia, diabetes, heart disease, um, stroke, all sorts of obviously things you don't want to happen. Yeah, and it. It's not all necessarily related to this inflammation, but a fair amount of it probably is. And there's this one study that that kind of paints this picture really well that I, I love. I think it's such a fascinating study. So it's it's in mice. Uh, it's Dr. Luis McCullough's lab at University of Houston. They were studying stroke, and so they would induce a stroke in the mice by basically restricting an artery. Blood does not go to the brain for some amount of time. Then they allow the artery to start flowing again. And so the blood returns. And so what you have is this very like scientifically controlled stroke, right? Mm -hmm. Like let's say 30 seconds, there's no blood. And so, you know, it's, it's controlled so well, cause this is science. We want to be, everything should be replicable. And so uh, what you would expect is that all of these mice that go through this procedure would have the exact same damage mm -hmm. in the brain, the exact same like severity of stroke. And that's generally true, but they found that certain mice had much bigger, more severe strokes, and they didn't know why. And so they started looking back in their notes, and what they realized is that those mice that had worse strokes were living in single housing. They were isolated. And so even though they had gone through the exact same stroke, mm -hmm. the damage that they showed in the brain was much worse. I mentioned that inflammation might be a key problem. So what, they, what they found is that when they suppressed those inflammatory signals in the brains of these mice and then gave them a stroke the stroke was the normal size again. So it seems like when these mice were isolated, they were experiencing more inflammation, neuroinflammation. They experienced a stroke. And now because the brain's not functioning properly and there's all this inflammation in the way, there's more dead cells. And so the severity is worse. You know, the mice were more likely to die. They were less likely to show recovery after. And so now if we take this out of mice and we apply it to humans, which, you know, you shouldn't really do that, but it, it's the similar a similar context, right? I just mentioned people are at higher risk of heart disease, you know, dementia, all these conditions. Well, if the body's tissues are not functioning properly and if there's all this inflammation, it makes us much less resilient to challenge and mm -hmm. to damage. And so, like, you know, if you, people who have a stroke, when they exit the hospital and they go into single housing where they're not with others, they're much more likely to have severe outcomes or have another stroke. And it kind of makes sense when you think, okay, yeah, chronic stress response being isolated that we may not even really perceive, which is why I'm kind of so concerned about it, has all this like underlying quiet, like whispered health effects on our longevity uh, that can play out, you know, in any really way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Before everyone spirals, <laughs> right? Because we're sitting here hearing this being like, oh my gosh, uh, there's all these adverse out health outcomes. And we know women are at very high risk for cardiovascular um, disease and events as they enter into menopause, higher risk of possible like hip fractures. And we already have covered so many times on this podcast, the 
oh, you know, mortality rates, which are, they just are not great when you have to talk about them and you look at like, what's the future? When we start to pair this with what you're saying now, it feels even more kind of doomsday. Mm -hmm. So before people start to spiral, what's like an easy way that they can start to mitigate some of this? Socialize. You know, I, this is the thing that I like hate about speaking about this topic is that it naturally leads to this conversation of like, what can we do, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like... So why do you hate that? Uh, I hate that the... That there's no like, well, here's a special tip that like you oh, okay, thought yeah, about before, yeah. right? It's like, no, just interact with people. Yeah. Um, the other thing too is that, you know, people tend to have a lot of like self-imposed barriers to interaction. A mm -hmm. ton. So many. I mean, just think about the last time someone invited you out and you felt, you know, last minute, you're like, oh, gosh, like, do I really want to leave the house? Like my TV's calling my name. The couch looks comfortable. My favorite blanket's right there. On the other hand, this this interaction might just be draining. I'm so tired already, right? Like mm -hmm. you can think of a million reasons why you shouldn't go. And sometimes we, you know, fall prey to that. And uh, and that that force wins and we end up not going. But number one, I think that if, if people understood uh, the actual significance of interacting for our brain health, then in those moments, it wouldn't be such a difficult decision. Because, you know, it's like people understand sleep. They understand why it's good for them. People understand diet. People understand exercise. They may not understand the molecular mechanisms, of course. I'm sure most people don't. But people have an awareness that it's 2 in the morning. You're scrolling on your phone. You got to get up for work at 8. And it's like, well, if I go to sleep now, I only get 6 hours. I should probably sleep because I know I'm going to feel worse. Mm -hmm. But I don't think people have that about socializing. I think that we view socializing as like a treat for ourselves or like a, mm. you know, it's a leisurely activity. Sleep is not necessarily a leisurely activity. It's something we do for our wellness. Exercise is for our wellness. Eating a healthy diet is for our wellness, but people don't view socializing as a part of this, this wellness, the wellness habits. And so I, I wish people started to view it that way. And so, uh, yeah, on the first hand, I'm hoping that maybe people can kind of reframe the way they view interacting. And then on the second hand, I'm hoping people will also understand um, what I just mentioned, that we we genuinely do impose barriers. I'm not speaking about that as, like, anecdotally as a human, although I can relate to that. I'm speaking about that as a scientist, that mm -hmm. there's a ton of research showing that basically humans m miscalculate, like, a ton of different stuff when it comes to interaction. We expect that people are going to reject us if we try to have a conversation with them. We expect that if we give someone a compliment that they're going to think it's weird, we expect that if we stay in conversation longer, the conversation is just going to continuously get worse. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we also underestimate our social abilities. You know, people think that they're pretty bad at socializing when they're actually not. We think people like us less than they really do. Like there are all of these reasons why we are anxious about socializing. And that often translates to, I'm just going to sit on the couch and not go out. And so on the second point, I'm hoping that people might start to think and or people might start to understand that it's normal to feel that way and that like all human beings feel this way. These are like scientifically documented phenomena that you will think, yeah, you know what, if I go out and hang out with these people tonight, I'm probably not going to feel good. But like that's statistically more likely than not to feel that way. But in, in reality, when you do go and you interact with people, you feel a lot better afterwards. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, the answer is socializing more. Um, I think we also, gosh, I just have so much to say on this. I mean, the, the, this entire rest of this podcast. We got time. <laughs> I could just go on and on about this topic. If you enjoyed this conversation, then I definitely want you to check out this.